we've introduced routing and we said there are a number of challenges with routing like what performance metrics or performance criteria do we use to select the best path? Do we use financial cost, delay, throughput or some other criteria? When is a path selected? Do we choose a path now for this packet and then for the next packet choose another path or make a routing decision or do we choose one today and, and use it for the next 24 hours? So the, when do we choose the best path? Uh, which nodes in the network are responsible for finding the information and setting the best path? Maybe there's a distributed approach where all nodes take some role in it or a centralised approach where there's a special server that records the best paths. And importantly, and we'll look at, uh, we've looked at is uh, what information do we need to collect about the network to calculate the best paths? I need to know something about who else is in the network and I need to know something about the link costs. So the more information I know, the more chance there is I'll choose the actual best path. So how do we get this information? And because things change, we're using the network today, but over the next uh, 24 hours things change in the network usage, we should update that information. That is, we should get an update on a regular basis so that we can make sure we still are using the best path. So we've mentioned some of those issues and some of the approaches some of the solutions to those questions. We went through a few in the previous lecture uh, looking at different cases. What we're going to do today is to, to re return to how we store best paths by looking at uh, the fixed routing strategy. So in fact we're going to go through three routing strategies, general approaches for routing. The first one and the third one are almost the same. Okay, so we'll spend some time on the first one. The third one is a small change to it. The first one's called fixed routing. The third one in the slides is called adaptive or dynamic routing. They're pretty much the same, so we do, we'll just explain the difference. The middle one, strategy two, which we'll present, flooding, is completely different from the others, so we'll spend some more time on that. So the routing strategies, the first is fixed routing. Let's say we we have the task of building a new network. Maybe the network is to cover the entire country. We, we are setting up a new uh, network to, to connect different cities across Thailand. So we put in the different switching nodes in the network and the links. And as the designer and builder, we know about the network. We know the number of nodes and links and we assign some cost links. So what we do then, while we design and build that network, is we calculate the least cost paths through that network. From every source to every possible destination, we calculate what are the best paths and we store those paths or, or some part of them in what we'll see as routing tables. And we briefly mentioned routing tables in the last lecture. How do we calculate least cost paths where there are algorithms that will do that for us. So given a network such as this one, let's say this is our network across the country, there are just six nodes. If we build this network then we can calculate the least cost path from node 1 to node 2, from node 1 to 3, 1 to 4, 5 and 6 and similar for the other sources, from 5 to every other node and from 4 for, to every other node. Well, if we have a larger network, we can use an algorithm to do it for us, like Dutch's algorithm, Bellman Ford, uh, and there are some other algorithms for uh, quickly calculating the least cost paths in, in networks. So we calculate them, and last lecture we actually calc calculated for source node N1 to all other five destinations, and we come up with these paths from source N1 to the five destinations we come up with the paths and the total path cost. What we do in fixed routing is once we've calculated the paths we store not the entire path but just the next node in the path. That is even though the path from N1 to N3 is N1, N4, N5, N3 
From N1's perspective, all we need to record is that the next node in the path is N4. The reason is because this concept that if N1, N4, N5, N3 is a shortest path or a least cost path, so is N4, N5, N3. So node 1 knows that the next node in the path is N4. Similar, N4 calculates the least cost paths from it to everyone else. And we did some of them last lecture. N4 calculates to get to N3, the least cost path is 453. So in fact, N4 only needs to store that the next node is N5. So by storing the next node, what we do is we send to that next node, and that node has the least cost path to the destination. And we eventually get the packet across the least cost path. So we'll see that and we'll continue the example. But rather than calculating the least cost path, so I'm sure you can look through there and find every least cost path. In the lecture slides we have the answers on this slide. Here are the next nodes in all of the least cost paths from each, each source node. So there are six tables, or called directories here, I'll call them routing tables. The way to read them, node 1, the node 1 directory at the top left. From source node N1 to destination of node 2, 3, 4, 5 or 6, the next nodes in the least cost paths have been calculated to be 2, 4, 4, 4, 4. Note that this second column matches our example. From source 1, we calculated the paths to N2 through to 6, and we get these. And the next nodes, we see 2, 4, 4, 4, 4, all right, summarized in this column. So we just store really this column and this column. And that is the key information in what we call a routing table. That is stored at N1. And we've done it for the other source nodes, N2 through to N6, and the routing tables for those are, are given here. That is, if we're at node 4, if we're at node 4 and we want to get to node 5, then the routing table tells us the next node in the least cost path is actually node 5. We can send direct. If we're at node 5 and we want to get to uh, node 1, then the next node in the path is node 4. So 5 sends to 4. So with fixed routing, we calculate the least cost paths. In this approach, it's a distributed approach where the information is stored at each node in the network. That is, node 1 stores this table. Node 2 stores the second table. Node 3 stores the third table. We'll see a centralised approach in the previous slide, but let's continue with this one. How do we use this information? Let's say node 1 wants to send data to node 6. Okay. Once we know the routing tables, we have one packet. Node 1 wants to send to node 6, so we create a packet. The source address would be node 1. The destination, node 6. Node 6 uses its routing table to determine who to send the packet to. And we can see, follow through here. Node 1 has a packet. Destination is node 6. So we look up the destination column. We find 6, OK, the last row. Node 1, therefore, needs to send this packet to node 4. Node 1 sends the packet to node 4. Node 4 gets the packet. The destination is still node 6. So let's see what node 4 does. Node 4 now has the packet. Destination is 6. We look up the routing table. OK, to send to 6, we actually have to send to 5. So we forward this packet onto 5. When 5 gets the packet, destination, the final destination is 6. So node 5 
forwards a packet onto node 6, according to the routing table. Node 6 gets the packet, and we're done. Node 6 gets the packet, realises that the destination address in the packet is itself, so the data has reached the destination. So, we generate the routing tables by calculating the least cost paths, and once the routing tables are generated and created uh, and stored at the nodes, to send the data through the path, we simply look up the routing table to see who to send to next. And that process is called forwarding. And this is basically how the internet works in how we deliver data through the internet today. It uses routing tables in nodes across the network, and those routing tables have the data created based upon routing protocols. And when we want to send data, we simply read the table to see who to send to next. The routing table, the general format is described here, that the destination node, the next node, and optionally, not in the examples on the slide, but we can usually will also store the path cost, if we know that. There's no need to, install, to store the entire path, just the next node in the path. Now the approach that we just went through was a distributed approach. Each node stores their own next nodes, we could have a centralised approach where there's one special node in the network, maybe node 7 in our network, a special server, that calculates the least cost paths and, and records that in this table. If you look closely, you'll see this is just a combination of the six other tables. The first column, source node 1 to destinations, we don't care about sending one to one, that doesn't, uh, that's not uh, relevant. So from source 1 to 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, the next nodes are 2, 4, 4, 4, 4. And similar for the others, the columns in this table correspond to the second column in the, the tables on the next slide. Different ways to store that information. The distributed approach is much better for large networks. It's easier to maintain that information and that's what's used in the internet and large networks today. So that's the basics of fixed routing. But we say it's fixed because we calculate the least cost paths, maybe when we build the network, and then they remain the same while we use the network. So we go away, we build the network today, we create the routing tables, we store the routing tables in the individual nodes. When they want to send data, they just look at the routing table to see who to send to next. Maybe if we added a new node, okay, we built the network and we decide in, in two months' time we need to add a new node in a new city, then we could update the routing tables. So when there are major changes in the network topology, adding a new lot node or link, we may update. So it's not fixed forever, but fixed for a reasonably long period of time. Now the problem with it being fixed is that as the the network conditions change. For example, the link costs change. If we don't update the routes, we may start using suboptimal routes. So we say that when the route is fixed for a long period of time, it means we can't respond when there are, there are short-term changes in the network. Maybe one link is be become congested. There's a lot of data going through the link. The delay goes up. Therefore, it's no longer the best path. With fixed routing, we don't care. We keep using it. It makes it much simpler, but it means we may use the uh, suboptimal path and get worse performance. The third strategy, which we will not say much more about, other than say, well, instead of keeping it fixed, on a regular basis or in some, uh, update the routes. Be adaptive. Change the routes as the traffic or the network conditions change. And that's what's used today in the internet, adaptive routing. Fixed routing is very simple in that when we build the network, we assign the routes and there's nothing to do after that with respect to routing. But it's not very flexible. When the network's running, changes in the amount of data going through the network may mean that there are better routes that we, we didn't initially select. So that's in... in uh, not very flexible and gives poor performance. 
adaptive routing, if we just jump through before we go back to flooding, basically do the same, use routing tables, create them at the start, but then on a, update those routing tables as we use the network. If we notice something changes, the link cost changes, then hopefully we can update the routes and get new routing tables so that we still use the optimal uh, routing, the optimal route. And this is what's used in the internet today and most new uh, large networks will use this. Fixed routing is only useful in small networks or networks where there are not many changes. With adaptive routing we can improve the performance because if we always or try to always choose the best route it means we'll get the best performance. With fixed routing, if we stay with a suboptimal route, we may get worse performance. So that's the, the advantage of adaptive routing. But adaptive routing is more complex. We need some way to, to collect the information about the current network status and recalculate the routes. So the algorithms for doing it uh, are more complex, more time consuming. And a key trade-off with adaptive routing is related to the quality of the information and the overhead. And it can be summarised as saying, the more information we collect about the network, and the more often we collect that information, the more chance we'll choose the best route. Okay? The more I know about the network, and the more I get an update about the network, the better chance I'll get the best, best route through the network. And that's a good thing. But to collect that information and to continually update that information, there's some overhead involved. We must send some extra packets to collect that information. And that's a bad thing. So more information is good for routing, but the more information we collect introduces a larger overhead. So that's the, the key trade-off with adaptive routing. We want to keep the overhead low, but we want to get as much information as possible. And coming back to our, our driving to Bangkok example, I want to drive to Bangkok at 4 p.m. after the lecture. Then to choose the best path, what I'd really like to know is what is the, the current traffic conditions at 4 p.m.? I'd like to know at every intersection across every possible path, how many cars are there? Or what's the delay at every set of traffic lights? If I knew that, then I could calculate the best path. But I need to know it at exactly 4 p.m. Maybe someone told me at 3 p.m. Or, or before the lecture at 2.30 what the traffic conditions were, but they may change between now and when I want to go. So I would need to go through more effort to collect that information. The more information I collect, the better chance I'll choose the best path, but the more effort required to collect that information. That's the same trade-off we have here. So let's go back uh, and We'll just finish with one last example using these routing tables. I think you, know, you have a quiz question where you need to create or fill in a routing table. Not so hard, you just need to find the least cost paths and fill in the next node. Let me, one, one thing that we can do to uh, one thing we often want to do in large networks is to simplify the routing table to make the amount of storage space we use as small as possible and when we need to update it we don't have to update much information. We've already seen one simplification where we don't store the entire path, we just store the next node. That makes it simpler. But there's another one and you may notice in these six, in some of them the, same, the next node is the same for, for multiple destinations. For node 1, if I want to send to node 2, I, the next node is 2. If I want to send to anyone else, 3, 4, 5 or 6, the next node is 4. 
So in fact, in practice, we can summarize that information, those nodes where the, the destinations where the next node are the same. Instead of having four rows, we can cut it down to one row. So I'll show you the concept of that. Sticking with our, uh, our network for the routing table for node one. That is focusing on this table. Let's write it in a summary form. Where the, again, the source node is, source is node one. And we want, we have two columns of interest, the destination and the next node. So we're going to create the same routing table as on the slide, but we're going to make it a little bit simpler. If the destination is node 2, the next node is node 2. That's the same as the first row on the slide. But if the destination is 3 or 4 or 5 or 6, then the next node is 4. Let's summarize that as saying if the destination is any other value, and I'll write star here as some form of wild card, meaning anything else, next node is 4. There's our summary routing table for node 1. We just need two entries, two rows in the routing table, rather than the five that we have on the, on the slide, where we introduce this destination, this special value. This star means, in my case, any destination Assuming we look up the destinations in order. Let's see how it's used. Let's first do it, uh, complete the, the routing tables for some of the other nodes. For node 3, for example. Maybe node 4. We'll not do for all of them. Node 4, destination, next. Try and write the summary routing table for node 4. And also node 5. How can we summarize the routing table for node 4? Have a look on the, the, the one on the lecture slides and see what we can do to summarize it. How many rows can we use for node 4? If we can use a wild card, one instance of a wild card. Wild card here means any value. Look at node 4. What are the common next nodes? Which one occurs most? 5, next node 5. So maybe we could use a wild card to mean uh, any value. That is, give specific routes to those with the next node 2, but uh, a, a general route for those with the next node of 5. Node 4, we will say, if we want to reach node 1, send a 2. If we want to reach node 2, send a 2. If you want to reach anyone else, there are only five other, five total destinations, so anyone else, send to uh, next node 5. And we, in this, uh, in this summary form, we can think that we would check the rows in order. We'll check the destination in order. We'll do that via an example in a moment. And for source node 5, we can summarize. What 
Well, we see that node de next node 4 occurs the most, so maybe we can say to destination 3, send a 3, 6, send a 6, anyone else, send a 4. So we cut down on the number of rows and as our network grows this use of a wildcard here, summary form, is uh, much more powerful because if we have a network with 100,000 nodes, if we have the full table we'd need 100,000 rows in the table and we need to update them all the time. But with the wildcard or what sometimes we'll call a default route, we can cut it down to just several rows, greatly simplifying the routing table. How do we use that? Let's say now we have a packet to send. Here's our packet. It has a header and some payload. Some data. This is the header. Inside the header, it's created by node 1. Let's say we want to send node from node 1, the source address is node 1, and the destination address is we want to send this data, the payload, to node 6. So node 1 has this packet. What they do is, since the routing tables have been created, they look up the destination. And in this uh, routing tables, we'll do it in order. And if it doesn't match, we'll check the next row. So the destination is 6, node 6. It doesn't match the first row, but it does match the second row because star means any value here, and 6 is any value. So it matches the second row, so that tells us that we can send it doesn't match the this destination, but it does match here, okay, any value. Therefore, we send this packet on to node 4. Node 4 will get the packet. Looks at the destination, it needs to go to 6. So let's look at the routing table. No, destination is not 1, it is not 2, it's some other value. Therefore, we need to send to next node 5. So node 4 will send the packet to node 5. Destination doesn't change. The destination's a final destination. Not 3. Ah, it matches here. It's 6. So we'll send this packet on to node 6. If we started at node 1. Node 6 gets the packet. The destination inside the header of the packet is node 6, so we realise, ah, this is destined to me. Let's, let's take the payload and process it. We've finished. We've got the data to the destination. So in summary, we, in both fixed and adaptive routing, we create the routing tables. And we separate the process of creating the routing tables and using the routing tables. Creating the routing tables is done usually in the background by uh, routing protocols. So to, to put the data inside these tables to determine the least cost paths, there are protocols that will do that in the background for us. But to send the data across the path we call forwarding and that is done simply by looking up the tables. So usually those processes of creating the tables or routing and sending data using the tables, forwarding, uh, uh, made distinct, uh, separate. And here we see a case of forwarding and we see a simplification of the routing table. That is, we don't have to list every possible destination, we can use some form of wildcard. In real networks, it may not be a star or a wildcard, but there are other ways to represent match multiple values, not just a single destination. Sometimes called a default route. Node 1 sends to next node 2. If the destination is 2, by default it will send to node 4.
final example. On my computer, I'm connected via my Wi-Fi. Uh, it turns out in the internet, and we'll cover that in a later topic, uh, we have routing tables for special devices in the network, the, the switches, which we'll often refer to as routers. But we also have routing tables for the end user computers, the hosts, like my laptop. So my computer has a routing table. And the, the command route will show me the routing table. There are multiple columns in this table, two rows. The, the top row is just the, the headers. There are two rows of interest. If we zoom in, the two, col the two first columns are the things that we may recognize or relate to the routing tables we've just seen. We saw in the routing table we'd have a column for the destination and a column for the next node. The next switch or the next router or another name for that node is a gateway. So here my software says the first column is the destination, the second column is labeled gateway, that's the next node in my path. And in the internet, we use special addresses. We don't use N6, N1. We use IP addresses to identify those nodes. So we see that one of the next nodes in the path has an IP address of 10.10.98.1. So we also see in this case, which is outside of the scope of what we're talking about now, we'll see later in the networking IP uh, discussion, that there are some special case addresses here. All zeros in the destination and all zeros in the gateway or next node. The 101098.1 address identifies a particular next node in the, ne in the internet. This all zeros address really means there is no next node. It means don't send it to another device, send it direct to the destination. You can send it without sending to a, a next node to get to the destination. And we, we'll see in the next topic, it typically means the destination is on the same LAN as you. You don't need to send to a new gateway. So that's one special case. And where we used a star to represent any value, here they represent the star using the all zeros address in the destination column. And it's a more complex, it's not processed in order, that's a, a longest prefix match, but the idea is if my computer wants to send to any computer with an IP address starting with 10.10.96, 10.10.96.1, 10.10.96.2, and so on, then the next node, there is none. That's what this tells us. You can send direct because they're on the same LAN as you. For anyone else, that's what this value means, for any other destination like 11.12.52.64, that is not starting with 10.10.96, for anyone else, send to 10.10.98.1. So that's a routing table for my laptop. Note that this allows me to communicate with anyone on the internet. Of the billions of devices on the internet, I don't need one row for the billions of devices. I just need two rows in my routing table. So this is where the simplification of using wildcards or, or values to match multiple destinations is, is very powerful. This is sometimes referred to as my default gateway or default router. Send everything, unless it's going to these destinations, send everything to 10.10.98.1. We will return to IP addresses in the routing table in the, in the topic on internetworking. Let's look at a, a different strategy, completely different. 
and we've mentioned it before, with, with the routing table, the least cost routing approach, we need to collect information about the network to calculate the least cost routes. But what if we don't want to collect anything? What if I want to send to a destination without knowing anything about the network? Then one approach, or the approach, is send to everyone. That is, I want to send to destination six, I send a copy of that data to everyone I know of and tell them when they get the copy, send to everyone they know of. And they keep doing that until it gets to destination six. This is called flooding. We flood the network with copies of the data with the hope that eventually the destination gets the copy. So we'll go through some examples to explain uh, how flooding works and some ways to, to make it perform a little bit better. And then we'll finish and come back to this and talk about the advantages and disadvantages. The example, we're going to use the same network as, as what we've used. Except, so you'll notice the links are the same, we still have six nodes, but we don't care about the link costs. And to make it simpler, we're not going to worry about the link direction. So this is the same network as before, but the link costs have been removed. You can follow, on, follow along using the slide. I'm going to draw the picture again and, and uh, make some changes. Same network, maybe look different, but it, what are our nodes? This is node one, two, this is four. There's no need for you to draw this because it's the same one as on the slide. Just easier for me to show some of the concepts. We want to get data from node one to node six. So that's our aim. We'll draw the packet again. So we have a packet. It has some header and some payload. And the header we're going to send from node 1 to node 6. So we'll have a source address, source equals node 1, destination is node 6. And we may see later some other fields, but so far let's assume that we know the source and destination. We have one, one piece of data to get to node 6, that's our aim. But let's assume the nodes know nothing about the network. Even though we can see that uh, node 6 is connected to 3 and, and 5, Node 1 doesn't know that. Node 1 simply knows it has three links. It doesn't even know who's at the other end of those links, we can assume. So how do we get the data from Node 1 to Node 6? Well, send copies of that one packet to everyone that we're connected to. So Node 1 starts, it has the data, it's going to send a copy on the link that will go to 3, a copy on the link to 2, and a copy on the link to 4. So we'll send three copies of that one data packet. So let's draw that. And I'll not draw the packet. Uh, you, you see on your slide there's a, a rectangle there. I'll just denote, OK, we send, I'll just denote it as an arrow. One will send a copy of the packet to three, to two, and to four. And I think it happens at the same time. We've got data to send, just send to everyone. And then when they receive that packet, the rules are with flooding, when you get the packet, you look, am I the destination? Okay, node four, for example, gets the packet. Is four the destination? No, the header says six is the destination. So four must forward that packet onto others. And the first rule, send to everyone. So 
Note 4 takes a copy of the packet received and, and duplicates it, sends a copy to 5, 3, 2, and 1. All right, so that's the basics of flooding. 2 and 3 will do the same. Now, there's some, some optimizations we can make so that we don't waste transmissions. The first one we'll see is that when 4 receives on this link, the destination is 6. I've just received a copy on this link. There's no need to send a copy back there. We know that node has a copy. And since they sent it to us, they must not be node 6. So there's no need to send it back to the one that just sent it to you. So we'll not do that. That would be a waste. So what 4 will do is send a copy to 2, 3 and 5. So we'll draw them. It sends copies of the packet to 5, 3 and 2. But also node 2 received a copy from 1, so node 2 does the same. Node 2 is going to send a copy to 4 and to 3, but not back to 1, because we just got it from 1. Now here's uh, some details about the timing may come into play here. Should 2 send a copy to 4 when 4 is sending a copy to 2? It may depend upon the timing, which one sent first which may depend on how long it took for the packet to get from 1 to 4 and 2. But in this simple example, I'll assume everything happens in, in phases. That is, in the first phase, 1 sends to its neighbours. In the second phase, those neighbours who received the copy all send at the same time to their neighbours. So 4 is going to send to 2, and at the same time, 2 is going to send to 4. Assuming this link is full duplex, we can send in the opposite directions at the same time. So we'll take note that node 2 also sends copies to 2 and 3. There's no need to send back to 1. And finally, 3 is going to send copies to 2, 4, 5 and 6, but not back to 1. That's the second phase in this flooding uh, protocol. What happens in the next phase? What's our aim? What are we trying to do here? What are we trying to communicate? From who to who? The packet wants to go from node 1 to node 6. We've got some, one piece of data to get to node 6. That's our aim. What have we done so far? First, node 1 sends to its three neighbours, and then the next phase, those three neighbours send to their neighbours, but not back to who just sent them. In the next phase, note that node 6 is going to receive that data. Some other things will happen, but node 6 will receive a copy of the packet from 3, the packet inside the header contains the destination of 6. When 6 receives this, it goes, OK, I'm the destination. This is for me. I've got the data. We're done. Or we've achieved our aim of getting the data from node 1 to node 6. So note, after 3 sends to its neighbours, then 6 gets the data, and we've, we've finished in delivering the data. But we may not be finished in transmitting packets in the network. Consider node 5. And let's consider first the packet it receives from 4. Node 5 gets a packet from 4. The destination is 6. Node 5 does not know that 6 has the data. Okay? It doesn't know what's happening at 6. So node 5 receives a packet from 4 and realises, OK, I must send this uh, to my neighbours. So 5 will send, for this one received from 4, will send a copy to 3 and a 6.
That's for the packet five received from four. It makes a copy and sends to three and six. But also, node five is going to receive a packet from three. Right? Think at the same time it gets one from four and from three. And at this stage, there's no way for five to know is this packet that it gets from three the same as the one that it got from four? The source is the same, the destination is the same, the payload is the same. Does it mean it's a duplicate or does it mean it's just the payload has been sent twice by node one? So there's no way for five to distinguish whether the packet from three is the same as that from four. Therefore, five should send again to neighbours. That is, it receives from four, sends to three and six. Also, it receives from three, so sends a copy of that to four and six. We'll see there's an alternative in a moment, but let's go through the, the dumb approach first. When it receives from three, five also sends a copy to four and six. So it actually sends two packets to six. They're actually the same ones, but it doesn't know that. Are we finished? Well, not quite. It gets complex. Look at node 2. Node 2 is going to receive a copy from 3 and from 4. When it receives from 3, it's going to send a copy to 4 and 1. When it receives from 4, it's going to send a copy to 1 and 3, its other neighbours. Node 4 is going to receive from 2 and 3 and send to 1, 5 and 2. When it receives from 2, it's going to send to 1, 5 and 3. Node 3 is going to receive packets from 4 and 2. Sending back to 1, to 6, to 5, 4 and 2. That's the third phase in this protocol. And then in the next phase, all those that receive packets will get copies and send again to all of their neighbours. And you can see quickly that the number of packets being sent growing rapidly. Okay? It's even hard. I may have made mistakes and missed some here. So, some issues here. We don't want to have to send too many packets through the network just to get data from node 1 to node 6. So far, how many have we sent? Can someone count them? How many green lines do I have? I think it's the same as the, the third picture on your... Oh, the, if you sum up on your three slides all the packets sent, how many do we get? Anyone can count? All the green ones on mine or on your three slides, all of the little rectangles. What do you get? Thirty-four or something, I've counted before. Okay. Should be around thirty should be thirty-four, I think. And in the slides, you consider all three slides and count those rectangles. That is in this approach. To send data to send one piece of payload from node one to node six, that was our aim. The first approach of flooding, we've sent thirty four packets in the network. Using this flooding approach, so far we've sent 34. If we had another round, there'd be many more. I cannot draw them all. We'll see that we need to stop at some point. And 
we'd like to reduce the number of packets we've sent. How can we stop? That is, we went through three rounds. How can we force the nodes to know, well, stop sending? We need to stop at some point. That is, node 5 is going to receive many packets from 3 and 4 again, and then it's going to send to its neighbours. How can we stop 5 from sending to its neighbours so we can not go forever? Well, we can introduce some form of counter and say, OK, if the packet has travelled maybe so many, has been sent so many times, then stop sending it. And if you look at your slides, you see that there's a number included on those packets. We call it the hop limit or hop counter. In this example, when we send the first packet, we include a, another field in the header saying this is the hop limit. And in this example, we set it to 3. And the meaning of the hop limit of 3 means that this packet is only allowed to traverse 3 hops, after which we will not send it again. So the way that it works, node 1 sends a copies to its neighbours and inside the header there's a hop limit of 3. Let's add, a, add that to our header. We'd include, when we generate the packet, the hop limit, I'll just write hop of 3. And the idea is when we send it to someone, they will decrement that hop counter. So in this case, no one sends to its three neighbours. When two, three and four get that, they decrease it by one, so it goes down to two. And the rule is, if it's more than zero, send it. If it's zero, don't send it. Discard that packet. So when node four received the packet from one, the hop limit was three. It decreases down to 2, and now two, node 4 sends copies to its neighbours, same as 2 and 3. When in the next phase the nodes receive, node 5 received copies and sent with a hop limit of 1 in the header. It decremented when it received 2 down to 1, sends copies to everyone. In the next phase, for example, Node 5 is going to receive a copy from 4 and from 3. It's going to receive 4 packets. But whenever it receives each of those, it decrements it down to 0. Ah, it's 0. Do not send. Throw it away. This packet has reached its maximum lifetime. It's a measure of how long this packet can be sent through the network. And that's a key uh, feature in many protocols, to limit the number of hops that packet can traverse. Uh, after which we, we kill that packet, it dies. We remove it from the network. So that's one way to stop, set a hop limit. Otherwise, these packets will be sent forever by everyone. So let's assume we used a hop limit of three. When we had a hop limit of three, we counted 34 packets. What if we did it again but had a hop limit of two? A second case. How many packets? That is, the original packet sent by one started with a hop limit of two. It's quite easy to see on the slides. Instead of starting as 3 here, this value would be 2, so we'd have 3 packets sent. When those neighbours received, they would all send to their neighbours the same way as this, but instead of the number being inside 2, it'd be 1. So they have another, what do we have, uh, 9 packets, so a total of 12 packets so far sent. 3 this round, 9 here. And then, remember it's 1, not 2, when a node receives it, it decrements down to zero and does not send. So it would only be 12 packets sent if we started with a hop limit of two.
Remember that both of them are delivering the same amount of payload to the destination, but the first approach uses a transmission of 34 packets in the network. The second approach just uses 12. The first approach is much worse than the second one. To get the same amount of data to the destination in the first approach with a hop limit of three, we must send much more through the network. So that's very inefficient. Reducing the hop limit increases our efficiency to get the same data to the destination, less packets. What if we set the hop limit as one? How many packets? Hop limit. Count the packets. Someone, everyone yell it out at the same time. How many packets? If we had a hop limit of one. Look at the first diagram on your slides. Count, count, count the rectangles on that first diagram. No, not six. Look at the picture, don't guess. We'll be here forever. Three. That is, a hop limit of one means when source node one sends the, fir the packet for the first time to its neighbours, it sets the hop limit in the header to be one. Not three, but one. When two, three and four receive it, they get the packet. Decrementer zero, therefore do not send. So only three packets transmitted. That's even better for efficiency. So the third approach, a hop limit of one, is better. We send less through the network. But what's the problem with the third approach? With the, what happened in approach three? What went wrong? Node 6 didn't get the data. Remember the aim to get the payload from node 1 to node 6. If we have a hop limit of 1, the data only gets to 2 and 3 and 4. It doesn't get to node 6. So less packets, but we didn't achieve our aim. So that one failed. Hop limit of 2, the data get, does get to the destination. And hop limit of 3, it gets to the destination. So they were OK. That is, we want the hop limit to be high enough such that the data gets to the destination, but low enough such that we don't have to send too many packets. In this case, the optimal hop limit is two. If we go less, we won't get the data to the destination. If we go more, we'll send more packets. But in general, we may not know how many hops to the destination, so it's difficult to choose the optimal hop limit. We, may must, we must make it uh, quite large. Often. Let's, let's consider some, some further optimizations. So rather than having to send all these packets, can we do even better? let's introduce a sequence number in our packets. One of the problems we had was that node 2, for example, received a packet from 4 and 3 and then sent on to its neighbours. But node 2 has already received this packet before. There should be no reason to send it again to your neighbours. You should only send it once to your neighbours. And the way to identify whether the packet is uh, the same as before is to include a sequence number in that packet header so that node 2 can identify, ah, this packet is the same as before. Let's ignore it. So we introduce a sequence number sent or set by the source. If we draw the, the packet now, Sequence number, SEQ, short for sequence, 
And we can set it to any value initially. Let's say it's a 146. I just choose a random number. The idea, though, is that when node 1 sends this packet with sequence number 46, every copy of that packet also has sequence number 46. When you copy the packet, you copy everything except the hop counter. You decrement that. So when node 1 sends to 2, 2 makes a copy and the sequence number is also 46. When 3 gets it, the sequence number is also 46. 2 is going to send to its neighbours and at the same time 3 sends to its neighbours, which 2 receives a second time that packet. And the way that 2 knows it's the same packet is it realises, I've received a packet with sequence number 46 from 1. Now I've just received a packet with sequence number 46 from 3. It's the same one as before. Let's discard the second one. Let's not send on to our neighbours. So introducing the sequence number is a way to again reduce the number of packets sent in the network. When node 1 wants to send new data to node 6, something different, it will change the sequence number. Increment it usually. So maybe we will not draw it. Uh, I'll let you count. How many packets sent if we use now a sequence number and a hop limit? A fourth case. How many packets would be sent if we had a hop limit of three, the original one, and we also use sequence numbers. So hop limit of three, even though we know in this case two is optimal, often we will not know what the best one is. If we set it to three but we included sequence numbers, how many packets would have been sent? Well, these three are sent, so the first three are sent. Those nine would be sent. Okay, we, we haven't. Once a node receives a copy of the packet, and then it sends to its neighbours, which in this case one sent to its neighbours, so one is done. It's sent to a neighbours. In this case, two is sent to its neighbours, three is sending to its neighbours, four to its neighbours. They would be sent. In the next case, note that, for example, 2 is going to receive from 4 and 3. Because of the sequence number, when it 2 receives them, it will discard them because they're the same as before. So in the next phase, 5 will receive and send one copy to 6, but there's no need to send back to 3 and 4. 2, when it receives from 3, will not send any packets. So this picture, if we imagine 4 doesn't send anything, 3 doesn't send anything, 2 doesn't send anything, 5 only sends a copy to 6. Because 4 has already sent copies to its neighbours. There's no need to send again. And the sequence number allows it to determine that. 4 has sent to its neighbours. So when it receives, it will not send to its neighbours in this phase. So delete these six from four, remove the four from two, remove all the ones that three sends, and from node five's perspective, it received from four and three, but it's the same packet. So there's no need to send back to three, there's no need to send to four, there's no need to send two to node six, only send one to node six. So what do we have before? We had 34 minus these 6 is 28, minus these 4, 24, minus the 8 from node 3 is down to 16, and minus 3 from node 5, 13 packets. With sequence numbers, we can reduce that down to just 13 packets. And the hop limit is, is 3 in this case. Almost the same as setting the hop limit of 2. 
without the sequence numbers. With flooding, our aim is to get the data from source to destination, and we did that with three of these four cases. With a hop limit of one, it didn't work, so that's no good. And the other aim is to send as few packets as possible when we get that data to the destination. And to do that, we have these features of use a hop limit and use sequence numbers, so we don't resend the same packet multiple times. And to get the data from one to six, we, with a hop limit of two, we can get 12 packets. With a hop limit of three and sequence numbers, 13 packets, about the same. So that all with flooding, but with different variations. Flood the network. What if we consider one other case? What if we use least cost routing? We actually created the routing tables in advance. Ignoring the overhead of creating the routing tables, if we did know the least cost route from source to destination, and the cost we define as hops, that is we send the packet across the least hop route, how many packets do we need to transmit to get data from one to six? So not using flooding, but using our original routing approach. If we had the routing tables already created and we wanted to get data from one to six, we'd need to send two packets. Because the least hop route from one to six is one via three to six. We transmit a packet from one to three, then from three on to six. So the best we can do is send two packets. That's if we didn't use flooding. With flooding, the best we could do that got data to the destination was 12 packets in our case. Worse if we had different parameter values. So we can now compare. With flooding, the overhead to get the same amount of data to the destination is much, much higher than least cost routing. Least cost routing to send the data doesn't take much effort. But with flooding, we need to send many different packets through the network, and that's wasteful. So that's the major disadvantage of flooding. The major advantage of flooding, it's very easy. There's no creating routing tables. There's no Dijkstra's algorithm. Don't have to discover the link costs. We just send to our neighbors. With a few exceptions about the sequence number and hop limit, we send to our neighbors, they send it on, and we get to the data the data to the destination. We note that if we set the hop limit too low, the data won't get to the destination. So there's a problem. If we set it to be high, we may have to send many packets through the network. There's a trade-off. A good thing about flooding Another advantage, when we send a packet, assuming the hop limit is large enough, when we flood a packet through the network, that packet or copies of the packet will take every possible path. Okay, if we have a, a no hop limit, a packet will traverse every possible path, including the least hop path. There will be a packet that goes from one to three to six. So in fact, we can use flooding to discover what is the least hop path. If we don't know in advance, we could flood a packet through the network and the nodes along the way record the path that it takes. When it gets to six, six, the first packet it receives, says inside the header, this packet was from one to three to six. Six now knows the least hop path 
from 1 to 6 and reverse. And it can send a response back saying to 1, in the future, don't flood, just send from 136. Send through the least hop path. So we can use flooding to learn about the network topology. The other nice thing about flooding is that everyone receives a copy of the data. If I want to send data not just to node 6, but I want to send data to everyone, then flooding works quite well. Let's say I want to send a message about the status of the network. I want to tell every other node what my link costs are. Then using flooding, I can put my link costs inside a packet, flood it through the network, everyone receives a copy. Now everyone knows my link costs. Every other node does the same thing, floods through the network, copies of the, their link costs. As a result, every node learns the link costs of the entire network and now can calculate the least cost routes through the network. So flooding is very useful for learning information about the network and that's what it's used for in practice. It's not usually used for delivering data, just for de learning information about the network topology. So the extensions I think we've gone through, we don't send back to who just sent us the packet. We can use sequence numbers so we only forward the packet once. We don't have to send when there's duplicates, again using sequence numbers. We can use a hop limit or hop counter. When it gets down to zero, don't send it on. Another optimization is selective flooding. In our flooding, we send to all of our neighbors. Selective flooding, if I have three neighbors, maybe I randomly select two to send to. The other one I don't send to. Again, to cut down on the packet sent, or instead of random, today or this time I choose the first two, the next time I choose the second two and so on. I can uh, rotate or choose the neighbours based upon maybe some characteristics. Choose this one with higher probability than another. That's selective flooding in that we select a subset of the neighbours to send via. Selective flooding reduces the number of packets sent but a, we may not get our packet to go get to the destination and it may not take the, the best path through the net, network. So there's some trade-offs with selective flooding. So let's summarise. Flooding, send to everyone in the network with a few exceptions. The good things, all possible routes are tried when we use flooding. Packets take every possible route, including the least hop route. So that can be used to learn the least hop route. All nodes are visited. Everyone gets a copy of the data. So that can be used for distributing information to everyone, like information about the network status. And it's simple. There's not much that the nodes need to do. I get a packet, I send to everyone. You get a packet, check the hop limit, sequence number, send to everyone. The problem, the key problem, it's very inefficient. As the network grows, then the number of packets that we send to get one piece of data from source to destination uh, is, is, is very high. If we use the wrong hop limit or selective flooding, we may not reach the destination. That's another issue. I think that's enough about routing. So let's, let's finish on this topic on routing and even the previous topic on switching. We'll summarise. There's a few slides on routing protocols and algorithms. That is, we've just talked about general approaches. In practice, there are different protocols that use these approaches. And there are many. Some of them are listed here, OSPF, RIP, BGP and others. We will not cover them and we will not look at the details of these protocols. In, if you take uh, 
one of the courses next semester, if you get through this course, you'll learn about some of these specific protocols, some more details about routing. So let's summarise on switching and routing. Some of the concepts we've learned from this topic and the previous topic. We're now talking about communication networks built from connecting devices across multiple links, not just a single link. And to deliver the data via these intermediate devices, we use the concept called switching, where the switching node chooses the output link to send the data via. And we introduce circuit and packet switching as two different approaches. Circuit switching used in telephone networks. Packet switching is a key part of the internet today. Routing is the, the, the step of choosing the best path, what we've covered on in this topic, choosing the path from source to destination. And we've talked about different metrics, like delay, throughput, financial costs for defining best, different criteria. Today we've mentioned some different strategies. In general, there's fixed and adaptive routing, where we find the least cost routes, store them in routing tables. The difference between fixed and adaptive is fixed, we, we basically have static routes. In adaptive, we'll continually update the routes. And we've seen the other strategy of flooding, completely different from the routing table-based approach, but has advantages. There are also algorithms for choosing the best path, like Dijkstra's algorithm and so on, and specific protocols that implement these strategies, which we haven't talked about. Circuit switching was built for telephone networks, and it's still used in those today. But it's not used for new networks so much. Packet switching was developed to be more efficient when we have a varying amount of data to be sent, especially data generated by computers, not voice data, but application data, web browsing, email, and so on. And packet switching is the key concept used in the internet, and all new, almost all new large networks built, what we call wide area networks. Our next topic will define wide area networks. Adaptive routing strategies are usually used in large networks as well. Where networks change a lot, we use adaptive routing. Routing tables are created and packets are sent via the path. There are different algorithms for calculating shortest path. Some key trade-offs, that, or the things that determine what is the best routing approach, which routing protocol to use, will depend upon how big the network is, how much data goes through the network, how much traffic, and how often that network changes. So there's no one best solution. What we'll look at in the next topic, we'll talk about what is a wide area network and what is a local area network and talk some aspects of those lands and WANs. And then after that, we'll look at the internet and the structure of the internet to close the course.